Alva, for most of my life, I've been tormented by the mind-body problem. This is the basic question they ask, what really am I? It addresses consciousness. Uh, is the I that I feel so certain about something real? Or is it an illusion? How does it relate to my brain, my body? Classic philosophical question. It goes back hundreds of years in its current form and probably to the beginning of recorded history or human language in, in, in any form. Uh, with neuroscience, we seem to have a, more and more of a, 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 an approach to understanding it. And I've been very familiar with neuroscience. Uh, you make the rather astounding comment today that, that really it's an open question. You're not sure whether the brain can do the work that requires us, that would be required to have consciousness. What, what, what do you mean by that? Maybe an interesting place to begin to think about that is with the, um, the phenomenon of neuroplasticity. Uh, the brain can change functions um, quite remarkably. In a series of, of experiments done at MIT, um, ferrets had their brains rewired, in effect, so that cells in the retina, which would normally project to visual parts of the brain, um, instead uh, developed axons sprouting in the direction of the auditory thalamus and the auditory parts of the brain. And what is remarkable uh, is that these ferrets learned to see with their auditory brains. That is, they learned to respond to light stimulation uh, with their auditory cortices. Um, so now ask yourself, what is it about the neural activity in that particular part of the brain that makes it auditory, that makes it visual? It turns out it's not, it's not the, the intrinsic local character of the neural activation. It's not the, the proximal stimulation of that cortical region by something at the sensory periphery of the body. I submit to you that if we want to understand why that neural activity is visual or auditory, as the case may be, we need to look at what the animal is doing how it is dynamically interacting with its, with its environment, and thus we can understand what job it is that the brain is doing, whether it's a visual job or, or, uh, or, an, or an auditory job. So one way of putting it is, if you were to shrink down to the size of a microscopic being and beam yourself down into the brain, I submit that you just couldn't tell by looking around at the neural fireworks, whether there was seeing going on or hearing, whether there was any experience going on. The seeing, the hearing, just isn't happening there. It's, it's happening thanks to the way in which the brain is subserving a larger interaction with the environment. And that's just another way of saying it's not a sort of a brain up. The brain, the brain isn't what sort of does it. It's, it's the, the brain as functioning in a context that makes us conscious. Certainly the primary theory that undergirds neuroscience is a brain-mind identity theory, that the content of consciousness, the content of everything that comes into us is represented and is exactly the same thing as something in our brain. Now, it's not philosophically exactly the same thing because it's, it, it's a matter of just semantics that the firing of neurons is not the same thing as the, uh, the picture of a, of, of, a, of a yellow balloon. They're, content not the same, but the total representation of that yellow balloon is in some way by a sequence of, of nerve impulses uh, in certain contexts, uh, in, in certain parts of the brain. That seems to be absolutely fundamental and, and, and unimpeachable. One of the striking things, there's really only one, there's, there's two claims that everybody working in the neuroscience of cognition and consciousness agree on. The first is that the brain is responsible for all of it. Yep. And the second is that we don't have a clue how the brain does it. <laughs> and I think that there's a tension between those two fundamental commitments. The fact that we don't have a clue. And by a clue, I don't mean that there's lots of technical details to be worked out. I mean, we don't even have the sketch of the back of an envelope summary of what an adequate theory of the mind in terms of the brain would look like. What we have is a lot of correlations that would go with what we see in our visual field. Neurons that fire if you see something horizontal or see something vertical or neurons that fire when there's change or when there's no change. And a lot of fine detail that, that one would hypothesize that you collect those together. 
millions and millions of neurons, each one reacting in a different way, that together and coalesce in, in, and are bound together in a in in a in an overall image that you would have to bring these things together, but that's what it would be. Right. Let me let me let me put a sort of a puzzle to you. Suppose you were an engineer with infinite powers. What would you have to build? What would you have to make to make me and my consciousness? Would making my brain be enough? Look, I think that is a fundamental question that is faced in uh, artificial intelligence and computer mm -hmm. science. That mm -hmm. is uh, is one of the hot issues of the field, and people are are are, are violently dogmatic on both sides. Computer scientists, in general, mm -hmm. say that there's a functional approach. That if you can functionally represent mm -hmm. what the brain does in mm -hmm. a computer at computation levels of ten to the eighteenth computations per second or 10 to the 20, whatever you calculate for our brain, then once you do that, then you will effectively have the same kind of consciousness. Others, of course, particularly dualists, would reject that. Mm -hmm. that's, an open, that's an open question. What I, would, what I would suggest is that if you wanted to build a conscious robot, the first thing you'd have to do is build an environment for that robot to live in. And you'd have to build a body for that robot to interact with its environment in. And that all of that... To, to create a conscious being, you need to build more than just, if you like, a sort of a nerve center. Well, because you, our, lives, our lives are sort of spread out in this dynamic. You can simulate that by, by giving it the appearance of, of, of an environment. The, the classic brain in the vat, where you have all the afferent, and, 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 uh, uh, afferent nerves that go into the brain feeding one way or another. And so you give the illusion of an environment. And that would be the same thing, wouldn't it? It's, 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 it's interesting. This is a, one of those wonderful philosopher's nutshells. People talk about the brain in a vat and just sort of leave it at that. But if you actually try to think it through, what would this vat look like? How, you know, what kind of structure would you need to surround this brain with so as to generate this? I submit to you what you'd ultimately have to do is give it a body and give it an environment. Well, uh, let, 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 me, let me say it differently. Let's take all the cranial nerves, 12 or so cranial nerves, and the spinal cord, and you have it, and then you have, you know, technologies a thousand years from now, or a hundred, or a million years from now, and every fiber that comes into the brain that we currently have will be programmed to a separate supercomputer so you could feed, and these are all connected together, you could feed just the right impulses that simulate exactly what we have in this world. Wouldn't that be equivalent to exactly the same thing? Because that's what we are. That's where we get our information. But the thing that you're, you're leaving out is that you, you have not described a brain which is alone sufficient for consciousness. What you've simply described is another kind of environment, in this case some sort of super futuristic technological sort of engineering center, which could substitute for our environment and have roughly the same effects. Yes. But it's not the brain alone giving rise to mind. It's the brain plus all these engineers carefully modulating the inputs that is, that is, that is uh, doing the consciousness. It's not a brain alone. And so that would be the same thing? It, it might. It might be, it might be a, the consciousness that would result might not be able to tell that it wasn't you or I, but it wouldn't be consciousness in a brain alone. It would be consciousness in a different kind of, of system coupled to an environment. If I, can, if I can produce an experience in you by directly acting on your brain in the laboratory, that doesn't show that your brain is alone sufficient for that experience. Because after all, part of the story is the neuroscientist acting on your brain. A fascinating fact about the human cortex, the mammalian cortex, is that cells are basically all alike. They have the same basic plan. There are a few different types of cells, but for all intents and purposes, they have their axons and their dendrites, they respond to stimulation, they fire, they produce an action potential. Um, Electrical spark of activity that it, propagates to exactly. thousands of other neurons. So you can't tell by looking at the behavior of an individual cell, whether it's a visual cell, whether it's a motor cell. If you want to understand what job that cell is doing, you have to step back and look at its involvement in a larger system. In the first instance, you want to look at its embedding in a larger population of neurons. But what I suggest is that you actually need to step all the way back and look at the way in which that, the firing of that cell varies as a function of what the animal is doing, varies as a function of the way the animal is dynamically interacting with its environment. It's only at that scale 
that you could say this neural activity is visual or this neural activity is auditory. And I think that's what these remarkable experiments on the plasticity of the, of the neonate ferret show us.